Good afternoon. I'm Sean Hargreaves. I'm here with my colleague Bill Christensen to talk about the latest tools for debugging and profiling DirectX 12 graphics. So this talk is going to be a few minutes quick recap of some things that you probably already know. A bunch of digging into some things that are available today, but that you probably haven't noticed yet or don't know about. And then we also have some demos of some new functionality that nobody has seen before. So starting with the quick recap. This bit, by now, everybody here probably should all know. You're in a graphics tools track, so presumably you know what Direct3D 12 is. It's a low-level graphics API. It's been out for a couple of years now. It's the lowest level DirectX that we've ever made. And that comes with all kinds of advantages. You get power, you get perf. It's more like a game console than PC graphics APIs have been in the past. And with that comes some challenges. You know, being low, lower level means that there's a whole new category of ways that things can go wrong that hasn't happened in previous graphics APIs. And because of that, we need tools, which is what this talk is about. So the first thing we did for tooling DirectX 12 last year is we brought the PIX tool from console to the PC. At GDC last year, we walked people through the first release of PIX. And over the course of last year, we've added a lot of stuff to PIX. I'm not going to go into details of all these features, but we've shipped many, many releases with a lot of cool new stuff lighting up. If you're not familiar with all of these, the PIX blog has details of all of them. We've been averaging about a release a month. You know, it's not, we, we release PIX when we have a feature worth releasing. We're not on a regular date-driven cadence. But 12 releases in one year is something I'm, I'm really proud of. A couple of big things I wanted to call out in particular that are, why is this clicker not working? There we go. A couple of interesting features that I think are particularly worth noticing is the Dr. PIX experiments, which we shipped in about halfway through 2017. There are a number of experiments in Dr. Pix that can dig into performance of draw calls in a lot of detail. So Dr. Pix can tell you things like how well your culling is working. If you're issuing draw calls that you actually could have just eliminated completely on the CPU, it can measure performance with those removed and tell you how much perf you're leaving on the table through imperfect CPU side culling. It can dig into quad histogram usage. So you can understand if you're submitting too many over-tessellated tiny triangles that's therefore getting poor pixel shader utilization, shading pixels that might not actually end up on the screen. And this screenshot on the left here shows the bandwidth experiment in Dr. Pix, which gives information about how much GPU memory bandwidth each call was using. That really, can be really valuable for understanding if you're memory bound, which a lot of GPU operations tend to be. This other screenshot on the right shows the warnings UI in PIX. This is kind of easy to miss, but I, I strongly recommend not missing it. We've been steadily adding warnings over the course of the year. And we think of this as kind of an expert system in a box. It's like a, a deep GPU expert. We've worked with IHV partners to understand what are inefficient usage patterns and built that knowledge into PIX. So it will go and detect things and suggest ways you could maybe do better. This screenshot came from a real game. This was actually a shipping title, and PIX found a bunch of things to complain about in it. And to give an idea of the perf win, an internal project at Microsoft applied these warnings to a, a real game engine. And we got an 11% perf win in some scenes just from doing what PIX said to do. This wasn't a rough in development title with lots of low hanging fruit. It was a mature engine that had already been used in some shipping games. So it had already been, been through a couple of rounds of optimization. So we, we were very happy with that result and recommend you take a look at the warnings. So that's the recap portion of the talk over. Now we're going to move on to some new things. So I want to talk about what it looks like to profile a GPU, given that GPUs are very, very parallel. Now, everybody knows they're parallel. We talk about that all the time. This is what makes GPUs fast. But what does that mean when you're trying to say, OK, how is my, where is my perf going? What PIX has right now, this is a screenshot of the timeline view that's the, the core of profiling in PIX. Those horizontal blue lines indicate for every draw call or dispatch. When did it start running? When did it stop running? And you can see they overlap. This is a very simple little demo app that has a couple of draws and some dispatches. So there's typically two to three of these running at the same time. But what does that actually mean as we dig in? So th these lines are overlapping. Does that literally mean that all three draws were going simultaneously, splitting the hardware in thirds? Does it mean that one of them was just clogging everything up so the other two were just sat there, maybe getting you know, the odd instruction executed every now and again, but basically getting starved? Were you basically just doing vertex shading? Were you doing pixel shading? You can see that a draw ran for a long time, but you don't really know which is the one to focus on and how are you going to optimize this code. We have hardware counters in PIX. 
those can help. And we have a range of low-level GPU counters that are available from AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA, different counters for each IHV. So that can give you information about how many texture fetches, how many actual shader ALUs each draw used. But that's still not the same thing as really understanding you know, exactly what ran when. So we've been working on this problem. And to, to explain the solution, we need to back up a bit and talk about what, what it, does it really mean when you say that a GPU is massively parallel. So I've made a very, very, very simplified block diagram. This is not representative of any real GPU, but it's kind of typical of the variation and the kind of structure you'll see. So this little blue box is a single shader execution unit that runs one shader at a time, one set of instructions with one, you know, one thing. That is itself a SIMD unit, so it can probably process 32, 64, maybe 128 vertices or pixels at once, but that's running in lockstep. Then in a GPU, there will be several of these. So we'll take a bunch of them and clump them down next to each other. And around that, there'll be some set of shared hardware resources. The example I'm using here is that maybe registers are shared across all four of those shader units. And then the GPU manufacturer will take a bunch of those and clone them and make a larger structure. And that might have also some kind of shared hardware resource. Like maybe the, the L1 cache might be shared between all of those units at that granularity. And that can continue any number of times. So there could be a number of these blocks with different L1 caches. There could be you know, many, many levels of depth and nested hierarchy. And each of these little, little blue boxes could be running potentially a different shader, working on a different draw call or a different dispatch at the same time. So what does that mean when we come to look at Perf? Well, really what we want is every single one of those execution units to be doing something useful. The GPUs get their performance through parallelism, and they're only going to achieve maximum performance if you're achieving maximum parallelism. So you want to keep them all fed. The simplest example where you're not going to keep them fed is if you just draw a single triangle that covers one pixel and then flush. Obviously, there's just, there is no parallelism to be found there. You can get similar problems in a larger scene if you keep changing state too much, and there are going to be limits on how much state a GPU can have in flight with each of these operating on you know, different PSOs, different render targets, different things that might cause flushes. The other thing that can break parallelism is if there's contention over shared resources. Because the leaf node execution units aren't truly self-contained. As you see, in this, in this imaginary hypothetical diagram, the registers are shared at a higher level, and the cache is shared. So if your shader uses a ton of temporary registers, there might not be enough to divide that pool of registers into four and have all four of those blue boxes running at once. So you know, the GPU can still run a shader that needs more temporary registers. It just can't run four simultaneously. So you could end up with some hardware sitting idle. So we've been working on you know, what does it look like to actually understand, are you driving all of this hardware to maximum efficiency or not? And we have a solution in PIX, which we're very happy to announce today. I'm going to show this running on an NVIDIA machine. Let me switch over. I hope they'll get the right laptop here. OK, and it's gone into power saving mode. That's great. Here we go. Bear with me a second. Sorry about this. Here we go. So this is an unreleased build of PIX. And this is the same capture that I showed that little screenshot previously that had not very useful lines on. So first, I'm going to collect timing data. This is the thing you're familiar with in PIX, where you have our little blue lines showing lots of stuff running in parallel. You can see there's a bunch of draw instance calls here in the event list. And they're all overlapping to a pretty remarkable extent, actually. That one here runs up to about 0.1 milliseconds. The second draw call is almost completely starts at the same time as the first one, but continues. The third draw call goes even further to the right. So I don't really have a good way to understand which of these draw calls was running when. So using the new GPU occupancy feature, I can go down here to the bottom left, click on Enable, and we will do an additional run. So what Pix has done now is we've collected for every single wave dispatch on the GPU when it started, when it finished, and which shader stage that was corresponding to, which piece of silicon it was running on. And that lets us compute this value we call occupancy. It's not actually useful, as it turns out, to just display the raw every single wave that ran when in a UI like Pix, because it's, it's way too much data. These GPUs are very, very big. So instead, we boil that down, and we compute a value, which is basically what percentage of this hardware was actually being used effectively. And so now I have this graph down the bottom that's showing much finer-grained information, not just what was running, but exactly when it was running. If I go to my first draw, you can see this is color-coded. So the green is vertex shader. The blue is pixel shading. You can see that draw started with a little burst of vertex shader unit work and really wasn't getting great occupancy at that point. It was just starting to get the GPU fed with work. 
Then it started kicked off pixel shading, which was kind of spiky as it worked through. And there was a little bit of vertex shading proceeding in the background. You see the second draw, which in this simple duration actually started very, very early. That means that we got as far as kicking off some work and probably running like, you know, submitting some work to a shader unit. But it didn't really get to run until significantly later. So you can see when that draw happened, then another draw, then another draw right at the end. For this app, you'll see a pattern pretty consistently that the vertex shading work starts before the pixel shading work, but it's almost completely pixel shading bound. So this is a level of insight into Perf that we've never had on PC before. Those of you who are Xbox developers will be very familiar with this. Xbox, through, Xbox Pix has had this kind of data for many years now. You'll be familiar with how useful that is for optimizing shaders and getting better use out of your GPU. We're super happy to bring this to PC and let those of you who have not had the privilege of working on Xbox have access to the same optimization potential. So this is coming in the next release of Pix. I've demoed it here running on NVIDIA. We're also working with AMD to light up similar functionality. And you should expect to see, see this on both vendors later in the year. And with that, I'm going to hang over to my colleague, hand over to my colleague, Bill Christensen, who's going to talk about debugging GPU hangs. Hi, I'm Bill Christensen. Uh, I uh, am a dev on the Direct3D team at Microsoft, and I spend a lot of my time on the care and feeding of the debug layer. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit now about the D3D12 debugging from the API side. So press the right button here. Ah. So uh, in D3D12, as Sean was saying, uh, D3D12 is designed to give you uh, maximum control over uh, the amount of work and overhead you're doing on the CPU and on the GPU. It's massively pipeline, massively parallel, but we've also made it much easier than for you than ever before to make a mistake that's hard to debug. Say, for example, that you recorded some operations into a command list where at least one of those operations is invalid, such as you left a descriptor uninitialized. Then you called execute command lists, and you began to do some other work on the CPU, getting ready for the next frame or the next portion of your frame. In the meantime, the GPU hit an error while it was running your previous execute. You only find out about that later on when you try to, say, create a scratch buffer or something, and you get a device removed error as a return value. This sucks. Uh, you've lost a lot of the opportunity to understand what context was available at the time that the TDR had happened. So I'm going to try and define three different buckets of errors that I'm going to try and cover approaches for debugging. One is the preventable mistakes. This is you've used the API incorrectly. You've uh, passed in some invalid parameters, or you haven't been staging your command list state correctly. Um, this is where, of course, the debug layer does, gives most of its value. Um, in addition, there's a lot of errors that you cannot detect during API usage because of the pipelining of work to the GPU. And really, it's only on the GPU that you have an opportunity to see those errors. That's where GPU-based validation comes in. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. The next bucket is the repeatable problem. This is where a particular frame or portion of a frame is known to have a problem in it. And as Sean's been saying, the PIX tool is fantastic for this. You can capture just those portions of your frame or command stream that has this particular problem in it and drill deep into just that. The third bucket is the ephemeral problem. These are the, pro the, the, the more uh, difficult problems to track down. They don't happen unless there's a right set of conditions. They may not happen until you're an hour into your game. They only, only may happen on a certain customer's machine who lives at a certain latitude and longitude at a certain temperature or whatever. Um, these are a little bit harder to, to drill down into. Um, and we're giving you some new tools here to at least be able to gather meaningful data from those machines to help you understand where a TDR may be happening. 
A lot of you uh, may have seen uh, last year at GDC, Max McMullen gave a talk on GP-based validation. We've also put out some materials and blog posts about it, but I want to kind of touch on it again one more time uh, so you understand. GPU-based validation is a feature of the debug layer that's not on by default. It's a bit heavyweight. Uh, it's slow. It will, um, it, it will, it patches your shaders and it patches your command streams um, and your shaders get patched a lot with a bunch of validation code. And what this is doing is trying to help you find uh, what errors could not be detected during the use of your API. So for example, if your shader um, is going to take an index value out of one resource and use that to look up a descriptor in the descriptor heap and it's out of bounds, we can only detect that during your shader execution. Um, looking, uh, trying to access a resource that's been deleted uh, is another example. These are GPU timeline problems. GPU-based validation is there to help you understand the GPU timeline problems that you may be getting. Um, because, it's, it's because it's expensive, uh, there are a set of APIs in GPU-based validation that let you turn on and off certain features so that it's more palatable to use in some of your uh, test environments. You can turn off, for example, um, resource state validation, which is one of the most expensive parts of the shader patching. Um, this might help a lot if you want to keep it on or some portion of it on in a lab environment. Another thing is if you have those repeatable problems uh, that you know you can get a capture of, um, the PIX UI is cool. You don't have to turn on GP-based validation deliberately at all during execution of your code. You can take just that capture that may contain a TDR or a rendering artifact, bring it into PIX, and then say run GPU-based validation. And that's going to report any GBV errors that you would, are going to want to see that you would normally see in a debugger if you turned it on. So one of the most common um, questions that I get is, the debug layer has told me I have a, a, an error in my code, but I don't see any rendering artifacts, or I'm not, getting, I'm not getting any problems in my rendering. Is this a bug in the debug layer? The answer to that is maybe, but um, Due to the nature of D3D, due to the nature of diverse hardware, uh, diverse drivers, and uh, just your know, basic operation, operating environments, memory pressures, and what have you, not all mistakes are going to result in, in errors in rendering in your current development environment. So don't assume that it's a bug in the debug layer. Drill into it. See, see if the debug layer is giving you a clue that you may have a problem. If you do find after investigating that you believe that, no, I, I actually am setting my states correctly on my resources, the, the debug layer is missing something. We're listening to this feedback. Uh, the best place to let us know about it is uh, the DirectX Tech Forum, forums.directxtech.com. Um, that will be the fastest route. I get an email straight to my desktop whenever anybody posts to the, to the bugs reporting on there. Um, you can also report issues on other sites as well, such as gamedev.net. We'll eventually uh, find it. We do, we do regularly read reports on there. Um, but I would first suggest, if you can, go into the directxtech.com to let us know if the debug layer is helping or hurting you. So when, you're when you know where a TDR is happening, um, there's a couple of things that you could do. You could just go ahead and hit print screen when you, when you think a TDR is about to happen or a problem is about to happen, or you can use the begin capture and capture APIs on the IDX graphics analysis interface. And Sean's gonna give you a demo of debugging with PIX. So I have here a PIX capture that, sorry, is my mic on? Okay. I have here a PIX capture that contains a TDR. So I used the programmatic capture APIs to take a capture of a frame that will TDR when PIX plays it back. So the first thing I'm going to do is hit start analysis. And PIX is now going to play my capture back. 
and it will TDR when it does this. So the first thing you see is a warning saying, hey, there was a TDR. You should not go and try and debug other stuff or work on perf until you fix that. The second thing you'll see is a warning saying, please use the remote connection. While PIX analyzes a TDR, playing it back is going to TDR the machine it's running on over and over again. It's kind of annoying if the UI that you're trying to interact with on your desktop PC keeps panging the GPU. So the recommendation is to use PIX remoting here so that you can have the UI on a stable machine and do the analysis on a second box. I'm going to ignore that here because I only have the one laptop set up. So now PIX is in a state where I have a capture loaded, ready to analyze. If I go to the warnings tab, it will show a couple of warnings saying there was a TDR. It recorded that a TDR happened while it was capturing, and then again a TDR occurred during analysis. And if I click on that, it will have a link to the event that hit the fault. But that's really not very useful because, hey, it's, it came from the signal right at the very end of the frame. That was when, when things synchronized back is when it noticed that the GPU had fallen over. This is the standard problem with debugging a TDR. It's the same thing you'll see in a debugger. It's not very helpful that you know the problem happened like at some point in some command list that got executed some period of time earlier. What we generally did on the, used to do on the PIX team when we had problems like this is start commenting out pieces of our code to see if the hang goes away and do a binary search and keep recompiling. And eventually, you hone in on, oh, it's the particle system that I added just yesterday. That takes ages. So we have a feature in PIX to help you with this. If I go to the Tools tab down here in Dr. PIX, we have a button called TDR Analysis. And if I click that, what PIX is going to do is work through my capture to isolate for me exactly which operation is the culprit. And this will take a while because it can't use the normal pipelined execution of D3D. It's going to flash a bunch of times because it is repeatedly hanging the GPU while it binary searches to figure, in, figure out the problem. And it's going to keep resetting it every time it hangs. If everything's stable, which it should be, it's going to recover out of the end of this and come back and say, I found it. The TDR was on event number 63. So then I can just click that link, go to 63. And it is that draw call that caused the TDR. That, that is a massive time saving over having to just laboriously comment out pieces of your code to get this far. Once I've got there, I can go to the pipeline tab and just use all of the regular PIX UI to figure out my problem. If I go down here, not everything's going to work. If I go look at, hey, what was the texture? Or what was the depth buffer that was being written to? Oh, the device was removed. I no longer have a copy of that depth. But if I go to the previous draw, for that one, it can actually populate the depth. So I can poke around. I can look at what resources were bound, try and spot what's wrong with that draw call, See what, you know, look at the shaders that were being used. It actually turned out when we dug into this particular TDR, the culprit was a resource free. The texture that was being used in that draw had been freed prior to the draw, and that was why it was hanging. That one piece actually is, Pix is not very good at helping with, so we're going to fix that. We have a feature in the pipeline that will show freeze in resource history and help you spot that more quickly. But you know, I strongly recommend using this. It's, if, if you can get a capture, the challenge for using Pix is, it, as Bill was saying, there's different categories of TDR. Pix is only useful if you're able to create a Pix3 capture that contains the TDR, which really only works if you have the ability to trigger the TDR reliably on demand when you want it to happen so that you can take the capture. It's not good for obscure race condition-y ones. But if you're able to get a PIX3 file, this is that we have a great tool that I think will really save a lot of time for narrowing down precisely where things are going wrong. And so I'm going to hand back to Bill to talk about the, the trickier third case. So the sporadic uh, TDRs that don't happen under all conditions or, or happen at random points deep into play on some customer's machine that you don't have access to or in a lab that's hard to reproduce. Uh, we have a, an API that's been around since RS3, but uh, I th we think we need to work on evangelizing this a little bit better because you can use write buffer immediate to place breadcrumbs into a buffer that tell you how far the GPU got before a TDR occurred. Uh, the write buffer immediate has the ability to do synchronized writes of 32-bit val val values into a buffer that you can look at the contents of this buffer post-TDR, after a TDR has happened, to understand what, mar what breadcrumbs were written and know, okay, I know that my GPU got at least this far before TDR happened. Um, you can take advantage of this. For those of you that are already uh, gathering debug data from lab machines or from uh, customers' machines, will want to integrate these breadcrumbs into the data that you're gathering 
giving yourself an opportunity to know, hey, I can see how far on that machine things got before the TDR. It's not 100% free, but it's not super expensive either. We found in our experimentation, at least on uh, most discrete devices in our runs, we're seeing about a 1% to 2% performance overhead if we issue right buffer immediate with a single 32-bit value on every draw, dispatch, resolve, copy, any rendering type operation. This is, while not negligible, probably acceptable if you have a machine that's being used uh, for debugging or if you have a customer machine that you want to enable it on because on that machine, there's a history of some trouble. Otherwise, what you could do is turn it on all the time, but just drop the frequency in which you call right buffer immediate, doing it for every end draws or doing it per PIX marker or some other particular API, such as resource barrier. There are two synchronized modes in write buffer immediate. The marker out mode says, when my value is written, all previous commands in the command stream have finished executing on the GPU completely. The marker in mode says that all previous commands have either finished running on the GPU or are currently being executed right now in the GPU. There's also a default mode. This is not an interesting mode for postmortem analysis or debugging. It's more of an interesting mode if you're trying to initialize sparse data at the beginning of a command list. That's not the subject of this talk. As I mentioned, the point of using write buffer immediate is for postmortem after TDR analysis. If you used a normal readback heap resource to write your markers into and the TDR happens, the memory that was backing that readback resource is not necessarily going to contain any real data anymore because the device has been removed. So we have another API that comes with some caution, but you can create an ID3D12 heap resource from memory that you've allocated. So that memory is the memory that backs the resource. It's called open existing heap from address on the device three interface. You have to use virtual alloc to allocate that memory. And it has to have certain properties. The memory has to be committed and reserved. And the pages have to be read write. I do not recommend using this API just for creating your D3D12 heaps in general. It has other characteristics which may not be ideal for general heap use. It's, it's going to be much better, though. It's going to be fantastic for this, because now you own the memory, which means if the device gets removed, you can still look at the contents of that memory. The DXG kernel and the driver are not going to change the contents of that for you. Simultaneous access rules still apply. This means that you cannot have two queues writing to the same resource at the same time. So if you're using a lot of concurrency and you're having, say, a, you know, a, a, a compute queue and a graphics queue running at the same time, you're not going to want to have them both writing to the same breadcrumb buffer. Um, I would recommend creating a separate breadcrumb buffer per queue. You may decide that you want to have you know, a unique breadcrumb buffer even per command list for a variety of reasons. Some of the strategies for using write buffer immediate for breadcrumbs. What kind of values do you want to write? Well, you could simply just write the index of a draw or dispatch call that was, that was just submitted. You can get fancier and put in hash keys into, say, a table that contains uh, PIX labels or call stacks of draw calls. <coughs> Um, if some of your, if you're, if you're using this for string labeling of, of, of points in a command stream, and your strings aren't huge, you could just place string fragments directly into the into the buffer in the values that you're writing. You might want to consider writing uh, a pair of values, the same value that is twice into the command stream with two modes, once with marker out mode, and the same value again to another location with marker in mode. And what that'll do is that'll say, hey, if I, if I see the marker written under marker out, 
I know that all previous commands have finished execution. Then if I see that value written to its marker in location, a different value that is written to a marker in location, then you know uh, approximately where the GPU is currently chewing on subsequent work. It gives you kind of a hot spot to take, to take a look at. Um, if you're interested in keeping track of the history of markers that are written, you can use your breadcrumb buffer as a ring buffer as well. Some caveats to consider. Write buffer immediate is a newer API. Uh, there, there is still hardware and drivers that, don't, that aren't guaranteed to support it. So call check feature support before you turn it on and start writing markers. The other thing to be aware of is that the GPU is allowed to progress past the marker write. So because a marker was written does not mean that the subsequent command did not start running or did not get completed. It means for marker out, the, the previous commands were finished. For marker in, the previous commands were either completed or, or are still in execution. It doesn't say anything about subsequent commands in the stream. And I'm going to hand it back to Sean. Thank you, Bill. So changing topic, I want to talk about memory and some features that Pix has for helping with understanding memory usage. So we all kind of roughly have heard of the concept of GPU memory. There are multiple types of it. This is important to understand to really get top performance out of discrete video adapters on PC. Um, some systems don't have multiple types of memory. If you're used to working on game consoles or phones or integrated systems, there's usually just memory, a unified memory architecture. But on higher end GPUs, there will be some amount of fast memory that's accessible to the GPU with best performance, typically less easily accessible to the CPU. And then there's a larger amount of CPU memory, which is still accessible by the GPU, but not with some perf penalty. And then you know, there's other types of storage, like the swap file or cloud backing storage, which are you know, completely not accessible to the GPU, but you could swap things into memory that the GPU can read from. So in this world, if you're running a game on a discrete video adapter, there's a few different strategies for how you might want to think about memory. The simplest is if all of the assets that you need are small enough that they fit into local video memory, just put them all there and forget about it. And it's, everything is going to be fast, and it's great and easy. If your game is too big to fit, which is commonly the case, even if your game fits on a high-end discrete card, you have to think there are, there are lower-end cards that have smaller amounts of video memory. So it's probably not going to fit across the entire ecosystem. One approach is to say, OK, what do I use the most? Put your render targets, your depth buffer, your textures that you use all the time into the fastest memory. And then put some other stuff, you know, big backing textures that you maybe don't use that much, or rarely use resources off into the slower memory. The most advanced dynamic strategy is you, know, you can make that extremely dynamic and move things back and forth, track what you need when, put it into the fast memory when it's needed, shunt it out when it's not needed. You know, you can, this, this can get very dynamic and virtual. The reason we're here talking about this today is the importance of managing video memory has changed dramatically between D3D 11 and D3D 12. In 11, you basically didn't have to think about this. The runtime and driver collaborated to do it for you. So they would track every single time a resource was used. They would maintain counts of least recently used frequency of access. And the graphics kernel made choices for you based on this kind of data. So it would move things back and forth. It would decide what kind of memory to put things in. Usually, it did a pretty good job. So in D3D11, we'd find most games could have significant overcommit, which is the term for when they're touching more resources than there is fast video memory. And it would, it would be fine. You know, not as fast as if everything fit in video memory, but there was no performance cliff. The downside is all of that tracking was very real work. Every single time you called set texture, set vertex buffer, there were little counters being manipulated and least recently used counts updated. And that, that costs. So in 12, we said, you know what? We're just not going to do that at all. The application knows more than the runtime does. Rather than the runtime watching what you're doing and trying to infer policy from that, we can, do it, we can get more efficiency overall if the application just says what it wants. So D3D12 gives you a couple of mechanisms to do this. There's a terrifyingly long API name, register video memory budget change notification event, which will tell you how much memory your, your discrete video memory target should be. 
That can change on the fly because Windows is a multitasking operating system. You know, we, we'd all like to think that our game is the only thing that matters and we can have all of the video memory, but that's not sadly necessarily always true. So the kernel may tell you, hey, there's another app running that's created a 12 device and it's also started rendering, so can you please pare down a bit and share? So your, your goal is to keep your, your fast memory within that budget that's reported to you. And the way you do that is by calling make resident and evict. You know, re make resident puts things in, evict moves them out and says I'm not going to touch it. And so totally up to you. You can move things, put whatever you want, wherever you want. If you don't do this, your application will still run. And as long as everything fits into fast memory, it will run with great performance. But now you're going to have a cliff, because if, if you go over that commit budget, the kernel will still try to keep things working for you. It's, it's not going to just kick your app out or prevent making forward progress. But it will not be able to make good choices. It's because it's not tracking usage information. It has no idea which resources you're using most. So it's likely to make some pretty terrible choices, like putting a whole bunch of textures that you've loaded but actually not even used once into video memory and putting everything that you're using out into slow memory. You do not want that to happen, so you, know, you should manage memory yourself. And this is where Pix comes in. So we have some tooling in Pix now to help with this. What I'm showing here is a timing capture. The timing captures feature in Pix is increasingly misnamed as we're starting to add things to it that are not really about timing at all. In this case, we're using timing captures to trace memory usage. So up here in the top left, timing, when you open a timing capture, it comes up with the timeline selected. I can switch across to this new tab titled GPU Memory Usage. And in here, now down, down at the bottom, I see a number of timelines that are showing all of the memory operations that happened while this trace was running. So if I move that up, you can see there are bars for created, evict, make resident, and paging. The paging is when the kernel actually moved memory back and forth between different types of memory. I can click around and look at all of these and see in the timeline, when did each one happen? I can see over here on the right in the resources table which resource got moved. When I collect a resource, I can see the whole history of that resource. So this particular heap, it was created, it had a residency priority. The application evicted it, then the kernel paged it out from local memory to non-local. A little bit later, it paged it back. You, the application called make resident, so the kernel paged it back in. So you can trace all of this. And this is a great way to look at if you're having performance problems. Is there a bunch of paging going on right at the point when your frame rate glitched? Is paging happening when you think it should be? Are you actually hitting the budget that you think you should be? Prior to this functionality in Pix, we kept telling people you should pay attention to this, but there was actually no way to tell whether you'd got it right or not. The other valuable thing to look at in here is down the bottom, you'll see a number of graphs. For this trace, they're not very interesting, but you can see I'm graphing local memory, the budget, and the commitment, and the usage. So budget is what kernel has said the application should be using, and commitment is what you're actually using. You know, look at those lines, if they ever cross. You can see in, in this case, the red line, which is the commitment, is actually slightly above the green line, which is the local budget. So this application is consistently doing it wrong. It's a test app. We did it wrong on purpose. You want to keep your commitment under the budget that you've been given. The other thing this tooling can help with is you know, OK, moving memory to the right types of memory is important. The other piece is just how much memory are you using? If you want to fit in video memory, using less in total is going to help you. And we also have tooling that can show with that. So there are a number of columns in this UI. I can see the size of all my heaps and how many heaps I've allocated. I'm going to demo a feature now. That's th this, this, what I've showed so far, is in the last public release of Pix. There are also some features in this build that we haven't shipped yet, but are going to be in the next release. So we started doing similar tooling for types of resources other than heaps in particular, command allocators. So can I get a quick show of hands? Who here deeply understands what a D3D12 command allocator is? That's about what I figured. When I was first learning 12, I, I, I came across this object called a command allocator. I had no idea what it was, but it was kind of annoying. You had to create one before you could create a command list. So I created one and forgot all about it. And we see a lot of engines are in that same situation. It turns out there's a massive clue in the word allocator in the name of that object. It allocates memory and potentially quite a lot of memory, depending on how you use them. So what I can do here, if I pull down this selector, I'm currently looking at heaps, I can go look at command allocators. And you'll see in this particular capture, I've got quite a lot of them. I'm just going to resize that view. So for some reason, this test app is creating 12 different command allocators, and they're each about a megabyte in size. We look at traces of some games, and your command allocators could be huge. We've seen games that are spending you know, half a gigabyte on command allocators just because they were forgetting to close them or reset them when they were done, or you know, created more than they probably should have. So I strongly recommend go take a look at that data and 
see how much memory is, is really being used and whether it's going in the right place. You can also look at descriptor heaps. This application has a pretty big one and a, one that's zero in size. And you can look at pipeline states and see how much memory those are taking up. That's another thing that can be surprising. A lot of apps create a lot of different permutations of pipeline states. The driver allocates behind the scenes. You don't know when you create a PSO just how much memory it's going to use. So Pix will show you now. And you can use that to make sure that you're spending the memory on the right things. So the final thing I want to talk about is ray tracing support. So I'm sure you've all heard that ray tracing is coming to DirectX. It's running you know, in hardware. It's real. We are, we are truly living in the future now. We have hardware accelerated ray tracing as an actual thing. What I want to talk about today is the level of support we have for that in PIX. We have an experimental build of PIX that was released this week that supports the DXR ray tracing functionality. This is not complete support. We can capture and replay ray tracing operations. PIX can view the resource bindings and the geometry that goes into ray tracing acceleration structures. There's a lot more to come. We don't yet support shader debugging um, for actually debugging inside the ray tracing shaders. The ray tracing support in PIX isn't yet compatible with hardware counters or the occupancy stuff that I demoed today. And one note is that ray tracing requires shader model six. That's the Dixel new, new shader compiler. But the GPU val validation stuff that Bill talked about does not yet support shader model six. So you can't use GPU validation with ray tracing yet. Obviously, there's more to come here. This is the first step down a path that we're going to be moving down for some time to come. So you should expect PIX to continue developing richer and deeper support for ray tracing. I'm really excited by where we are today, though. This is the first time I can remember that we've released a major new rendering pipeline feature and had tool support for that available at the same time, ready for you to start using as you adopt the new feature. So we have a PIX ray tracing preview. There's a download link there. This is not yet in the master build of PIX. It's going to be merged back soon. So the next official release of PIX will include full DXR support. But for now, if you're doing DXR, use that, use that special PIX preview build. I'll show you quickly what that looks like. I have a small confession. I was hoping to do a live demo here and chickened out right at the last minute. We have some fixes that were flying around. And literally, an email arrived about an hour before this talk saying, this, this build is good. And I wasn't quite brave enough, so I'm going with screenshots. But this is what PIX looks like supporting ray tracing. It's very much the familiar PIX UI. You can see there's a dispatch race call selected in the event list over there. In the API object table, PIX can dig into state groups and show you know, what this is an any hit shader that was bound, closest hit shader. So you can understand the structure of how the ray tracing pipeline has been set up. In the pipeline state, we can expand all of the bindings that are in a shader table. So ray tracing is all based on an additional level of indirection compared to how resources have traditionally been accessed. And it's, it's quite tricky sometimes getting those tables set up. It's very useful to be able to just go inspect them and see if you've got your indexing wrong. And then the big view here is the acceleration structure visualizer. The PIX can read back from the driver all of the geometry that the ray tracing is using and inspect that so you can understand, you know, have you built it correctly? Ray tracing is very dynamic. You know, there's a whole system of doing incremental updates to acceleration structures if things are animating or changing over time. You know, it's easy to get those wrong. So we have visualization to make sure that you actually are rendering the geometry that you think you should be. 